Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So Canto 10, Chapter 35, Chapters entitled The Gopi Singh of Krishna, Texts 20 and 21. Kunda Dama Krita Katu Kaveso Kunda Dama Krita Kautu Kaveso Gopa Godana Rito Yamunayam Nanda Sunur Anage Tavavatso Narmada Pranayinam Vijahara Kundam Kundadamakrita Kautukavaso Gopa Gopana Rito Yamunayam Nanda Sunir Anage Tavavatso Narmada Pranayinam Vijahara Kundadamakrita Kautukavaso Gopa Godana Vrita Yamunayam <coughs> Nanda Sunar Anageta Vavatso Narmada Pranayinam Vijahara Vaya upa vyatyanukulam manaya malaya jas parsane senam vandinastam upa deva ganaye vadyan gita bali bi parivaru 
Kunda of jasmine flowers, Dhamma with the garland, Krita made, Kautuka playful, Vesa his array, his array, Kopa by the cowherd boys, Godana and the cows, Vritta surrounded. Jamunayam along the Jamuna Nanda Sunu the son of Nanda Maharaj Anagai O sinless lady Tava your Vatsa darling child Narmada amusing Pranayinam his dear companions Vijahara, he has played. Manda, gentle. Vayu, the wind. Upavati, blows. Anukulam, favorably. Manayan, showing honor. Malayaja, of the fragrance of sandalwood. Sparsesna. The touch, Vanina, those who offer praise, Tam, him, Upadeva, of the minor demigods, <coughs> Gana, members of the various categories, Ye, who, Vadya, with instrumental music, Gita, singing, Balabi and presentation of gifts. Parivaru, they have encircled. Translation, O sinless Jim Yasoda, your darling son, the son of Maharaj Nanda, has festively enchanted his entire, has festively enchanted his attire with a jasmine garland. And he is now playing along the Jamuna in the company of the cows and cowherd boys, amusing his dear companions. The gentle breeze honors him with its soothing fragrance of sandalwood, while the various Upadevas, standing on all sides like Panagirists, offer their music, singing, and, all, and gifts of tribute. I'll read it again. Osilus Yasoda. Your darling child, the son of Maharaj Nanda, has festively enhanced his entire with the jasmine garland, and now he is playing along the Jamuna with, in the company of the cows and cowherd boys, amusing his dear companions. The gentle breeze honors him with its soothing fragrance of sandalwood, while the various Upadevas, standing on all sides like panegyrists, offer their music, singing, and gifts of tribute. Very short purport. Srila Jiva Goswami explains that the gopis are trying, I'm sorry, Srila Jiva Goswami explains that the gopis are again in the courtyard of Mother Yasoda, the queen of Raj, and they are trying to encourage her by describing Krishna's return to Vrindavan after he has spent the day herding cows and playing. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti comments that the Upadevas, the minor demigods mentioned here include the Gandharvas, who are famous for their celestial music and dancing. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Dena Svaishi Gudave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svat Padanti Kam Bande ham shi guru shi uta pade kamalam shi gurun vaishnavam sha shi rupam sagrija tam sahagana ragana tam bitam tam sajivam sadvaitam sarvadutam parijana sahitam krishna chaitanya deva Sri Radha Krishna padam sahagana lalita Sri vishakam bitam sha E Krishna, Karuna, Sindhu, Dina, Bandhu, Jagatpate, Gopesha, Gopika, Kanta, Radha, Kanta, Namostute, 
तप्त कंचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदा विनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुति देवी प्राणमामि हरि प्रिय वंचा कल्प तरुविष्ठा कृपा सिंधु भए बचा पतिथानम भावने भयो वैष्णवे भयो नमो नमः श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्थानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार शिवासरी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे श्री वृंदावन धाम की जय सो द गोपीज आर स्पीकिंग there are gopis it says when the gopis speak they sing <laughs> there's a verse that says that in the spiritual world all talking is singing all walking is dancing and the constant sound is krishna's flute this is the enchantment of the spiritual world here the, the gopis are you might say pacifying or giving assurance to mother yasoda that krishna is soon to return after playing all day with his friends cows cowherd boys in the pasturing grounds mother yasoda because of her intense love for krishna when krishna leaves to go play she cannot stop thinking about him she's always thinking when will he return she's always thinking about is he hungry is he playing okay is he going to get is he going to get hurt is a cow hoof going to step on his foot as a mother with pure love she's constantly worrying but at the same time constantly thinking of him in in full devotion and love and feeling the separation of krishna and krishna has been gone just for most of the day playing because when krishna performs his activities in the dham it's simply playing that's all in this material world people have to take time out to play and their play is just as bad as everything else they do <laughs> you see they get drunk last night i couldn't sleep because somebody was playing next door <laughs> loud music all the way up to 1:00 in the morning <laughs> i don't know if that's called playing but i guess that's what they say it is <laughs> but when krishna plays it's so wonderful in fact to just to go back a little bit <clears throat> when uh, lord brahma after having stolen krishna's cows and calves calves and cowherd boys and krishna manifested himself in all the different manifestations of these cowherd boys and calves this is described in the 13th chapter of the shrimad bhagavatam it's probably one of the sweetest chapters ever because it was the last last chapter that shila prabhupad presented before his departure and he writes with great depth and love about krishna's pastimes describing it in such a sweet way and as lord brahma was there after krishna had manifest himself in the boys exactly and then krishna revealed to lord brahma that each of the calves and each of the boys were him and all the calves and all the boys miraculously apparently miraculously transformed into manifestations of forearm vishnu forms right before the eyes of brahma and brahma was astounded he couldn't believe what he was seeing that little boy who was just simply a child who likes to sit at the bank of the river jamuna and play with his friends and eat different kinds of foods prepared by the different mothers of the cowherd boys they exchange their foods and they laugh and they joke 
that same person appeared in so many manifestations of the Vishnu forms with four arms holding all the different weapons. Brahma saw that and all he could do was bow his head in, in complete humility and at the same time complete um, what we might say humiliation along with humility. He was humiliated because Brahma had such great power and he offered beautiful prayers, and those prayers are the 14th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Beautiful prayers by, by Brahma. Probably the, one of the most beautiful chapters as far as the prayers describing the glories of Krishna. And, pro, and, and it's described in that section that Krishna was just waiting for Brahma to get over with the prayers. Because he didn't really want to spend too much time listening to this four-headed demigod off her prayers. He just wanted to go back and play with his friends. <laughs> In fact, he was really impatient. Um, he's, he, Krishna's, he looks like, come on, Brahma, hurry up, get it over with so I can go play. You're just, you already caused me enough trouble by doing all this stuff, and now you're keeping me away with these prayers. You know? <laughs> Krishna just likes to play. <laughs> And Prabhupada said, this is, the, this is the result of bhakti. Bhakti means you can go back to the spiritual world, pure bhakti, and again, you can play with Krishna. <laughs> Here, we're, we're trying to play like we are Krishna. <laughs> and that's a problem. <laughs> because our pastimes are not pastimes. They're more like confusions. The happiness in this material world as displayed in the and the the forms of the different personalities who like to do different things to enjoy life is just an expression of one's unhappiness. <laughs> it's just a try to counteract the misery of this material world. So we can't say that expressions of attempts at happiness is actually real happiness. It's just some antidote for the suffering of being in the material world, being in a material body. Real happiness is the expression of the soul's natural love for the Lord, displayed in various manifestations of itself. And Krishna exhibits all these things in the spiritual world, and he invites all his parts and parcels to come back and again to take part in these wonderful pastimes with him. But we're so stubborn, we like it here. <laughs> Material world is not so bad. <laughs> At least right now it isn't. Maybe tomorrow it'll get worse. <laughs> and so this is the confusion of the conditioned souls. They don't know really where real happiness is. And Krishna is both enjoying in himself this expressions of his own transcendental nature because that's the nature of the spiritual world. Prabhupada says there's no work in the spiritual world. You don't have to go to work. Isn't that great? You can retire, <laughs> go back to Godhead and enjoy life in transcendental loving service to the Lord in pure spiritual happiness. That happiness which is natural and has no beginning and has no end. Now, some people might think, wow, whew, happiness all the time? That must be boring. <laughs> Don't you need a little variety to kind of make, mix up the happiness with something else so you can really appreciate the happiness when it's not there and, and really enjoy it when it does come? <laughs> Well, we might say that's the philosophy of a moron. You know what a moron is? He's really more off than on, but they call him a moron. <laughs> a moron is a person who beats his head against the wall, and then when he stops, he says, wow, that feels great. <laughs> because obviously beating your head is not very you know, that's a lot of pain. <laughs> so, but when you stop, you think, well, it's a relief. <laughs> so people don't understand transcendental happiness, that it's always increasing and full of variety, and it never gets old and boring. 
It only gets better. And it, it takes various manifestations of itself in the forms that it takes. It's like when, Krishna, when Radharani gets angry at Krishna, Krishna gets happy. He's happy about it. And Radharani expressing her anger is actually expressing her bhakti to Krishna in the form of anger, which is another form of transcendental love, <laughs> which is the nature of love is it's always wonderful, always joyful. So all manifestations of that natural propensity to love Krishna in the various varieties that it manifests are in the spiritual world unlimited. In the material world, we're trying to find happiness in different ways and we do different things. And, but we get tired, we get bored, it gets old, we look for something different. And usually we go back to the same things, right? Because there's not much variety in the material world, although there's some variety, but not much. Usually when happiness gets really boring, then people's happiness become miseries for other persons. <laughs> my, my, mis my happiness is your misery. <laughs> it's another form of misery for both, both persons. So this is the material world is just like, it's like you went shopping and you bought the wrong thing and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's a bad bargain. And Prabhupada says that being in the material world is like Having a material body is like having a bad bargain. So everyone goes shopping for a bargain, but somehow or other you got cheated. I think that happens a lot in Bombay. <laughs> I was recently told that it's, that's the main thing that goes on. <laughs> a lot of bad bargains. So, but th then you think, well, what can I do with my bad bargain? You have to change it into some good bargain, and that is devotional service. So, there's only one one activity for the souls in the material world is to engage in devotional service to the Lord, which fulfills all desires and brings one to the per per perfectional stage of one's purpose of existence, transcendental love for God, which is eternal and never what we say diminishing, and it's always increasing, always increasing. Here, this Yasoda is feeling a type of happiness that is mixed with a type of transcendental suffering or pain. We might not say suffering, but transcendental anxiety that Krishna is gone, and I haven't seen him all day. Although thinking about him with great concern and great uh, anxiety, she's ex experiencing the presence of Krishna in that anxiety. This is the beauty of transcendental separation. That separation, when it becomes so intense, it satisfies the person who is feeling the separation more than one, when one meets it. Because the intensity of separation just brings out the love within the heart in such a way because one can't feel, feel fulfillment in that separation. So therefore, it extends itself continuously and one feels more and more anxiety and separation, which is another form of transcendental happiness. Does that make sense? Did you all follow that? It's, it, we might say, <clears throat> when you have something and you lose it, then the thought of regaining it just increases more and more. But if you never had something, the thought of getting it doesn't, is not as strong as those who have lost it and wanted to return again, because the experience of having it is intense. <laughs> and then lost becomes even more intense in the anxiety of wanting to rehab it back again. So that's, that's the nature of love for Krishna. The devotees in this world who are struggling with the process of devotional service are always thinking that my service should be an expression of my love for Krishna. 
And in that somehow Krishna will accept my service and in that accepting of my service Krishna will be pleased. And in by when Krishna is pleased then all my desires to, to satisfy Krishna are automatically fulfilled perfectly and completely. And then the devotee feels satisfaction. But the devotee never feels full satisfaction until they can actually again meet Krishna. <laughs> Although all the various stages of bhakti have different manifestations of love in various forms, until the devotee can actually again associate with Krishna in transcendental loving service, the devotee feels that there's something always lacking. <laughs> and that's natural. And Krishna creates that, in that mood by always encouraging the devotee to surrender and to to engage more and more in devotional service. The expression to serve the Lord, even at the expense of inconveniences that one may encounter in the service of the Lord, is actually an expression of love for the Lord. This is a very important part of the, when we say, deeper meanings of bhakti. There are those who want to practice devotional service and want to do it in such a way that it's very easy and nice. But devotional service, is, it's always simple in the execution. But Krishna is always encouraging the devotee to surrender more, to offer more, to pray more, to chant more, to associate more, more and more. The quality of increase is always there both in its nature of qualitative and both quantitative. If one doesn't constantly focus on that method, mood, then one will gradually revert back to more lesser forms of devotional practice. One has to always be encouraged, trying to strive to increase quality and quantity in devotional service. Quality is also a form of increase. How can I serve nicer? How can I chant nicer? How can I, you know, do my service in such a way that the quality that I offer to Krishna becomes nicer and nicer? It's like making garlands. There's so many ways you can make a garland, right? Those who have somewhat of an artistic nature, they make garlands in so many wonderful ways putting the different colors of the flowers in different sequences and making the flowers in different uh, places within the garland just to enhance the variety of the uh, quality of the garland, to increase its, its attractiveness, to increase its complexities like that. So when, when one has that mood and garland making becomes so nice, not just putting one flower after another and think, oh, I strung it, it's okay, it's done. <laughs> so that's just an example we may use that whenever, whatever service that a devotee has, they're always thinking how to make it better, how to do it in such a way that it will please the Lord in the mood of bhakti. The mood of bhakti is to please the Lord. Here, the gopis are trying to please Mother Yasoda by making, decreasing her... Um, transcendental anxiety by saying, well, Krishna has been playing all day with his friends in the cowherd fields and he's, um, you know, he's decorated with this type of attire. He has a jasmine garland. He's in company with his friends and there's beautiful breezes blowing off the Jamuna River and uh, the fragrance of sandalwood is there and the devas are there glorifying him in so many ways and singing and there's dancing. And they're speaking to Mother Yasoda in such a way as that she'll become a little less anxiety and knowing that Krishna will return very soon. Krishna, and, that, and that's, what's, that's what she wants to hear the most. Although she's happy to hear all the descriptions of Krishna's activities, she mostly wants to hear, when's Krishna going to come back? <laughs> when is Krishna going to come back? Like that. When is Krishna going to come back? The devotee always thinks, you know, um, aparana muchi 
Sudanam Ruchi, Nabarama Guchi, Sudanam Ruchi. You know, when will that day be mine? When my offenses decrease, my taste for the holy name increases. When or when Bhakti Vinoda Kaur prays, when will that day be mine? When will that day be mine when I can chant the holy names in full absorption and in love of God? When the audio is hankers. It's hankering for perfection. It's called Lala Sa Mai. Lala Sa. To long for perfection in one's devotional service. And that, that brings out the deep love within the heart that is there and that is wanting to express itself. So wanting to love Krishna in the best possible way by serving Krishna in the best possible way. And whatever service we're doing, it's not so much the service, but it's the mood of the service that attracts the attention of the Lord and gives us satisfaction. Prabhupada would say, some people are out preaching, distributing books, and others are cleaning the temple, but there's no difference because Krishna's accepting the bhakti. Krishna is atmarama, he's self-satisfied, fully complete in himself. There's nothing you can give to Krishna. We might use the example, maybe many of you are aware of this example, when you want to worship the Ganga, what do you do? You take Ganges water and you take it in your palms and you hold it and then you offer beautiful prayers and you pour the water back into the Ganga. And that's the offering to the Ganges. You offer back her own water. <laughs> so what does Ganges water have to do? What does the Ganges have to do with the Ganges water? But that's the way to worship the Ganges. So in the same way, Manaso Deho Geho Yokichu more arpilu to albade nanda kishore. Uh, that whatever I have, my dear nanda, nanda kishore Krishna, it's yours anyway. <laughs> my home, my wife, my possessions, my wealth, my very existence, it belongs to you. So to offer it back with bhakti is the essence of the of that offering, because. One time one devotee came to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I want to renounce everything. Prabhupada said, you have nothing to renounce. It doesn't belong to you in the first place. <laughs> if, you, if you say that, uh, if you take something from someone and you say, well, here, here's a gift for you. When you give it back to the person you gave it, who, who you took it from, you know, I steal something from you and then I return it and say, here's a gift. <laughs> That's quite ludicrous, isn't it? <laughs> it it's belongs to the person you took it from, so returning it is not a gift. So in the same way, what can we offer to Krishna but our, our bhakti? And that bhakti is expressed by surrendering to whatever Krishna wants and trying to think in our own way how to do more to do better in our devotional service like that. If we become complacent, or if we become what we say, what's the word, somewhat, uh, you know, settled into a certain mode, then we don't, you can't taste the happiness in devotional service. One has to keep always thinking, what else can I do? <laughs> What, how else can I do something even more in a better way? And that, that inspires the devotee in so many ways. When Prabhupada began the Krishna Consciousness Movement in 22nd, 26th Second Avenue, he was just giving a lecture and every, every few nights a week and cooking for the new people who were coming to the place and you know, serving it out and cleaning it up. He was doing everything. But then as time went on, Prabhupada was doing more. He was opening temples, traveling around the world, and translating the Srimad Bhagavatam and other literatures. And he kept doing more and more and more and more and more. 
And although he was inspiring so many thousands of devotees to do so much more, he never stopped in his own service. And because service is so nice that those who are absorbed in devotional service, they think, what else is there? <laughs> when Prahlad Maharaj was offered a benediction by his, and, you know, Lord Sringadev, because Lord Sringadev was so pleased with Prahlad for offering beautiful prayers and showing so much bhakti to Prahlad, to Nishringadev. Nishringadev wanted to reciprocate Prahlad Maharaj's love in so many ways that he offered him anything. And the, Prahlad Maharaj, one of his responses was, you know, I'm not a vanik, I'm not a merchant. I don't worship you for anything. I'm simply happy in my devotional service to you. And But the Lord was encouraging because the Lord is so pleased with the, the devotee's love and his devotee's service that the Lord wants to reciprocate by offering something back. And the devotee is always thinking, I don't want anything but more service. That's all. But sometimes Krishna tricks you and he gives you something anyway. <laughs> he does that just to, just to, to reciprocate in some way or another. So, but when it came to Prahlad Maharaj, finally Prahlad Maharaj being constantly encouraged by the Lord to take a benediction, what did he say? Let me stay in this material world and preach. Let me be your instrument to uh, uplift the conditioned souls, knowing that's the heart of the Lord. To see more and more of his parts and parcel come back to him in devotional service. So Prahlad just pleased the Lord more by his surrender and by his bhakti. <laughs> so devotional service is so nice <laughs> that no, you can't trade devotional service for anything material. What can it compare to devotional service? Devotional service is so powerful, at least pure devotional service is so powerful that it can capture Krishna himself where Krishna cannot be captured by anything else. What captures God is what ha what the Lord ha what the what the devotee has in his heart is bhakti, pure bhakti. And to get Krishna means to get everything and more. <laughs> Krishna is everything and more. Now, does that make sense? Outside of everything, there's nothing. But then Krishna, there's Krishna and everything. <laughs> so a devotee. And knows that there's nothing greater than devotional service. And the gopis, they're fully in love with Krishna, absorbed with Krishna, just thinking about Krishna, hankering to associate. And here, they're singing the glories of Krishna in such a way that they want to pacify the, the transcendental anxiety of Mother Yasoda in such a way that that she doesn't feel, you know, you know, the, too much pain and separation. So here the gopis go beyond their love for Krishna by trying to pacify and serve Krishna's mother in such a uh, pleasing way. So that's another, another element of love, to inspire love within the heart of another. What can you do? They, they see in the Christian tradition they say, um, love your, love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And in the second commandment, they say, love your neighbor as yourself. So those who have some understanding of that second statement say, loving your neighbor means to give your neighbor the best possible thing you can possibly give. So giving your neighbor Krishna <laughs> or an opportunity for devotional service. That would be the greatest gift you could give another bringing others to Krishna consciousness or assisting others in their service to the Lord. That's called Vaishnav Seva. It's also called Jiva Doya in the sense that when it takes the form of preaching. So that's an extra added element of bhakti is that to inspire others in their own bhakti. Okay, so the gopis are singing the glories of Krishna to Mother Yasoda. 
And one last thing here, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has mentioned, in relationship to the Upadevas, it's mentioned in the purport that the Upadevas, that means the lesser demigods, uh, they stand all around while Krishna performs his pastimes and they sing, they dance, and they glorify the Lord by tr transcendental poetry, describing his wonderful pastimes in so many ways. And they're famous for that. So that is wonderful seva, to hear and chant the glories of the Lord and to sing and dance in transcendental love for the Lord. Okay, any questions, comments? Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, Jagannath Prabhu. There's a microphone. Thank you, Maharaj. One obstacle sometimes arises. Only one. Oh, in, in reference oh, to. Oh, okay. In reference, uh, in reference to. In, in reference to wanting to improve quality of service and mm. quantity of service. Mm. Sometimes someone joins a, an ashram, for example, but it's an emergency situation and the person gets more kind of service than he can do in a proper way. And so while he's in the midst of that service, then it becomes difficult to be praying for more service or better service. <laughs> it, it, and so um, what kind of advice is there for such persons who, there are a lot of persons in that situation who I personally know. Uh, when you already have a lot to do and why should you pray for more? <laughs> well, you know, you, then you could just focus on quality, focus on the quality and enhancing the quality of the services you have. As you increase the quality, you'll find that it becomes easier to do more and more services as the quality increases. Because it becomes more natural. So you don't have to pray for more service, you might have to pray, for, you just be thankful for the service you have and at the same time try to do the service in a way that is very pleasing. Because there's no limit to how much you can perfect the quality of whatever you do. We can do that with anything, not, not just service. When you're thinking about your interactions with other living beings, how to increase the quality. His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj speaks about this in a very direct and powerful way. How to focus on the essence of whatever you're doing, especially when you're in interaction, interacting with another. What is the essence of that interaction? What, what makes that interaction so pleasing and so uh, successful? Is to focus on the relationship between two souls who are trying to, what we say, communicate or to interact in such a way as to accomplish something through that interaction, focusing on the essence. I think Maharaj can explain that much better than I can. But he gave a whole talk on this, on the essence of uh, what we say relationships. So you can apply that same thing because service is the essence of the relationship with Krishna or the spiritual master. So when you're interacting with your service, you're interacting with the spiritual master, with Krishna through that medium of service. So what is the essence of that interaction? Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bhav.